Welcome to the fourth session in our series, Beyond Human, The Last Call. Well, I have to take the position of assuming that you have watched session one, two, three, and if you really are trying to understand it, I, I hope you've watched them more than once. And now it's time for number four. We're trying something different today. We haven't tried this before. <clears throat> we had a session earlier today, and we're going to try a second one in the same day, and we're asking T and our helpers in our Father's Kingdom to bear with us, and we hope this is their desire, and if it isn't, I'm sure they'll let us know. And <clears throat> we'll get right on with our questions, because the way we are now designing our format is to listen to our previous session and recognize the things that could be enlarged upon or uh, clarified some, and we then redo our questions. And Alex, I think you're the next one on our question list. What is your question? Well, did you want to start off talking about two containers and the uh, Trinity? Okay, two containers and the Trinity. That sounds like a strange combination, doesn't it? What they mean by two containers, and we've talked about this a number of times in the classroom, is um, earlier in, like in session three, we discussed the vehicle, the soul, the mind. And we said that the soul was the container for the mind. And we kind of assumed in that same picture that the vehicle is a container for the soul. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> in a sense that's correct, even though the soul encompasses probably a little bit more space than the vehicle uh, takes up. But it's, it's a good working hypothesis to consider the vehicle, a container for the soul, and the soul, a container for the mind. So keep in mind that <clears throat> we don't listen to the impulses of the vehicle. We're the ones that have the choice, the free will, the options, the listening capacity and the deciding making capacity for what direction to take mind into the soul or into our package of information, our pillowcase or our container for information by asking in the direction of our Father's kingdom or, if we're not careful, listening to things we didn't ask for. <clears throat> now, how does that fit in as part of the same question of what's the Trinity? Well, a concept that has been so misunderstood and so debated over the years in doctrine in the churches, in the churches, that's another question, is the Trinity. When someone is a member of our Father's kingdom, even if they are visiting in or on a task in the human kingdom, but if they are a member of our Father's kingdom, they are a trinity. They are within themselves a trinity in the truest sense of its meaning. <clears throat> now, we just discussed the two vehicles and the mind. Now, how am I, if I am a member of my Father's kingdom and I'm on an assigned task in the human kingdom, how am I a trinity? Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Father, I am because of my task and because of my station in my Father's kingdom, I am a father to children. I am a piece of pipe in this conduit that serves younger ones, newer ones, 
and therefore I am a father to sons. In the same sense that T and I both served in the capacity, and still both serve in the capacity, as fathers to these students. I am a father. I am the I am a son. I am a son of my Heavenly Father. I am in a sense, since T is older, I am a son to Father, to T. T is in a sense my father. <clears throat> I could now I can be a father even to grandchildren. And sons can even look to a father that is in, if you want to use the human analogy, even a grandfather. I mean, even if I want to say that T is my father, and the father that was the father to the partnership is still the same father that even the classroom can associate with. But they've been taught and they've learned from experience that if they start looking to that, that they cannot know on a personal basis. Remember, in previous lesson we've talked about a personal basis and a, and a, a point of identification. A personal relationship with a member of the Kingdom of Heaven is what keeps you the track on track. If my Heavenly Father, or the Heavenly Father that was the one above T and O, has assigned T and O to do a task with these students, and He has ordained that task, He has approved that task, He has the authority to establish that task, I'm afraid he does not permit you to bypass it. He says, look, I've given them to you. If you know me, you'll see me in them. If you don't see me in them, either they aren't of me or I am not in them or you do not have the capacity to recognize me. Same was true in Jesus' case. Those who listened to him, those who were his students, his disciples, those who called him teacher or rabbi or shepherd, they could not go off and pray to his father. They did not know his father. They knew him. Plus, his father had said, this is my son of whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. I've given him to you. And he's certainly more than adequate to fill the bill for your needs. Now, Lucy jumps in, and boy, he has a heyday with that one because he can try to shoot that one down in every direction. But if you know our Father, you will recognize that to be true. If you want our Father and you continue to test that truth, you continue to test that truth, and the world does not pull you back, you, your, your assurance or your uh, knowing that you are on the right path will increase and increase and increase. <clears throat> it's certainly expected of you, as it was with these students, as it was with T and O. When T and I were first awakening, we, goodness, we thought, how can two people go insane at the same time, in the same ways, when all of a sudden we're, we're thrown together and we're as different as night and day, and, and here we've been on the together a few months, and the next thing you know, we're, this information is coming into our heads that we've come from the kingdom of heaven to deliver some information about what the truth is in the kingdom of heaven and how you get from the human kingdom into that kingdom of heaven. Goodness, we couldn't understand. The point I'm making is doubt is a common lesson ground. It's, it's, uh, you can't expect to not go through it. I know that any of you that are listening today could easily doubt everything I'm saying. I expect you to doubt it. I want you to doubt it. If you know my Father, you cannot put him to any test that he cannot win. If you continue to pursue him and you are not overcome by the forces that would turn you astray. 
Jesus warned, don't worry about losing your life. Worry about losing your soul because there are those in Satan's kingdom who would even rob the soul of the elect, those that are chosen to get closer. So <clears throat> this is a dangerous business. Doubt is par for the course. We don't expect you to not have to deal with it. Did I answer your question, Alex? I think you covered it pretty well. Okay. Nora, what's next on your list? I um, wondered, um, can a human vehicle be considered or recognized as a perennial? Well, I'm glad you asked that because I realized in session three that when we talked about the tulip, or when that information was given to us, then later as we listened to that session, more information came and said, you could, if you want to use this, you can use this, and it will clarify. You know, um, a good illustration of that, of how the human plant is a perennial, is to think of the family tree of the human vehicle, the human plant. Let's say the family tree is the Thompson tree. And the, those who call themselves Thompsons, they have a tie to that tree. Now, you're really tied to a couple of trees in the human kingdom. You're, the, uh, you're tied, uh, let's say, for example, a female is not only tied to the tree of her mother and father, but she's also tied to the tree that she moves into by marriage. So, in a sense, she she has two trees that she's then tied to. And depending upon which one she is the most tied to, is the most likelihood that she would return to the next time she came up from the bulb under the ground like the tulip. In other words, if the Thompson family is the perennial plant, then for a vehicle to die and a human or a soul that is in the human condition leaves that plant, it's no different than a leaf from the Thompson plant wilting and falling. And for every leaf that falls, one or two more leaves come back. And they, in that same Thompson branch, we will be filled by the soul that's standing in line to get in that Thompson branch, that extension of that family tree, according to the degree of their bind with that family tree. Now, a funny thing here about using the name Thompson. When you're in the process of overcoming, one of the things that helps you, and this is this was kind of adopted in a way in the in the Catholic Church when um, nuns and some of the monks are uh, hermits, some of the ones that isolate themselves more in uh, thoughtful studying conditions, they take another name. They take a name of a saint or some biblical name, and it helps disassociate them with the family tree. It helps get their mind more on their pursuit of their concept of God. Now, I must admit to you, and this is one of our secrets, but our whole session, our group of sessions here with you are, we're telling information that have been our secrets for many years. And now some of those secrets are being passed on to you. And I do this with reluctance because I know of how it hurts some family members, and yet no intent is ever meant to hurt a family member. That's not the way of our Father's kingdom. But the truth is that that soul belongs to, if that soul has any mind of our Father in it, even if it doesn't, the soul still belongs to our Heavenly Father. When a soul begins to recognize its true parentage, 
it cannot help but relate to the soul's parentage. The soul was created. If that soul is going to move into a kingdom level that on, only relates at the creation basis, not the reproductive basis as known in the human kingdom, it's going to relate to its father, the one above it, the one that nurtured it, the one that taught it, the one that brought it through a womb, so to speak, from the human kingdom into the heavenly kingdom. So part of what we do in our classroom is we take other names, no particular significance. I spoke of Nora and I spoke of Alex, and yet that's not the name that you'd find on their driver's license or on the birth certificate of the vehicles that they're wearing. But it applies to them satisfactorily to the soul, and all they are is the soul, because that, have, that is what they have become. They do not relate to the family tree that the vehicle they're wearing relates to any longer. They, <clears throat> excuse me, they are denied that. They must be denied that. That family tree, because of its methods of even remaining a family tree, has become corrupted because of the influence of, and at this point I want to apologize to all the Lucys out there, and I'll try not to use that term again. I'll use Lucifer or I'll try to use Satan, because I certainly don't want the Lucilles or the Lucys to feel good. Man, I can't stand to listen to that guy because he, he speaks of Satan using the, my name. It's interesting that we bring this up when we're talking about names. If you come this way, you'll lose that one anyhow. <laughs> I'm teasing. But I do apologize, and I'll try to remember to make the reference Satan and Lucifer, because I do not like to offend you. Our Heavenly Father does not like for you to be offended by anything of His that we deliver to you. Our Heavenly Father does not like these families of the physical, physical vehicles of the classroom to be hurt by what they're doing. They have the same thing that we possess. They have that little option. They have that free will. They can look, Nora's family and Alex's family, they can say, I may not understand what they're doing, what they're pursuing, but I know they're trying to get closer to their Heavenly Father. And I've just got to put them in His hands and trust that He will lead them in the right direction and not let them go astray. That is their option. Or they can hate me. I would hate for them to hate me, not because I hate to be hated. I would hate for them to have to be responsible for hating an instrument that has been chosen by the Kingdom of Heaven to be a vessel or a megaphone, an instrument for the truth to be delivered to those who want to move out of the human condition into the Kingdom of Heaven. I've dreaded this topic, but we have to discuss it. They Nora has probably several names. She has one that, should she get stopped in a traffic jam or if she turns when she shouldn't, a stop sign, she has the right one on her driver's license and, and she doesn't hesitate to use it, but she doesn't even identify with that name at all. And then the name Nora is also, she has another uh, name that she uses should she need to work in the world in order to sustain our tummies or to put gasoline in the cars that we drive. She has a name that was probably part of that name that showed up on that birth certificate or that driver's license, and she'll use that name at her work because it's not the one that she, that the old influences or the old vehicles, impulses would respond to. So frequently this is what we do, and the only reason I'm telling you this is because we're in session number four now of this series. And if you're getting more and more interested, you're trying to think, Whoa, 
What is this overcoming all about? What does it mean to be separate from the world? Where were we? Who's next? Alex, where are we? What's next? Well, um, where does this information come from? <laughs> does it come from you? <laughs> well, we just answered that, but we'll answer it again. If it comes from me, it comes from the wrong source. Now, it can come from me. Let me give you an example of how I got off track this morning. Only today I got off track. I get off track all the time. We had a recording session this morning. And in my eagerness to get this task done, we've been doing one recording session a day. And here came a day when I thought, well, maybe we have the staff on hand, we have the crew on hand, and the time, maybe we can get in two recording sessions. And what did I just say? I said, I had the thought, maybe we could, whoops, I had the thought. Now, even though I can't stop every time that I say to you or to them, I talk to T and I ask T what T thought about this, even though it's improper, it's not necessary, that's my responsibility. It's, it's not, and, and I'm responsible for that. I'm also responsible for what comes out of my mouth. And when it's off track, I'm responsible for that. I'm responsible to get back on track. I'm responsible to acknowledge the zillions of times I have acknowledged to these students that I have recognized by asking my older member, was that off track? And yes, it was a little off track. And so I said, whoops, we were a little off track. And so we've got to get back on track. And this is what we do. So we don't, we continue to work against getting off track. What I'm saying is, I thought, well, we could have two sessions today. And then after the first session, when I was a little pooped, I went in my privacy for a little while and I said, T, whoops, I forgot to ask you what you thought about two sessions today. Now, during session three, believe it or not, the funny thing I felt was that by proceeding with it, which was not the time of day that we have been proceeding with sessions, and I felt that those who were helping us, T and T's helpers who were helping us with the session, they kind of scurried to, to get here and to help us. And it was like we had trouble getting going. We had trouble moving in, uh, being good vessels. I had trouble, it's like my word processor didn't want to work. And I was trying to force things and trying to pull, which wouldn't have happened had I stopped and said, T, what do you think about our having an earlier session and a later session in the same day? Now, I'm just using that as an example. Where does this information come from? I'm quite capable of giving you mis misinformation. Wow, this gets into another issue. You have to learn that, here comes this old word, if you know my father, if you learn that I am devoted to my father, and my father uses me and you can recognize him through me, then you have to involve yourself in a position of trust with me. Trust with the instrument that he has appointed, or assigned, or given. The instrument that now T continues to use, and that I am responsible for asking each little thing, each little thing, all day long, all night long. Each time I slip and don't ask, I catch myself needing to go back and ask. Now that's good, it helps develop my habit of better asking, because I'm sure that that you, you think, well, I've always known about asking. Asking you shall receive. Seek and you find out. No, those things. 
but how often do you ask? About how serious does the question have to be for you to ask it? And when you ask it, if you don't get an answer, do you go ahead? Or do you wait until you get one? And if you don't get one, then do you assume it's, it's not time for one, or this is off base? Now, I'm not saying before you put the first spoon of your bowl of cereal in your mouth, you have to say, Oh, remember, would you have me put my first spoon of my cereal in my mouth? And then, would you have me put my second spoon of my cereal in my mouth? No, that's ridiculous. That's carrying it to an extreme. But believe it or not, I don't feel that it is an extreme to ask my older member, what do you think about this kind of cereal for this vehicle at this fuel stop or this meal, this time to consume? Does that seem okay? If it's something you wouldn't approve of, I don't want to put it in this vehicle. So if it is not proper, if you do not approve of it, I want to know about it. That's just to try to help you know the degree of asking. So, these students have learned that I can forget to ask at times. I can give misinformation. But they also know that I continue to go back and recognize that. And I even hate to say that because I don't want to give myself even credit for continuing. You know, I have to mention this one little thing. It's a silly, stupid little thing that Christians get into debating. Once saved, always saved. Nothing could be further from the truth. I can fall as fast. I can fall ten times faster than I can rise. It's ten times easier to fall than it is to climb one step in the right direction. This is not an easy task, the one of overcoming, the one of getting into our Father's house, the one of leaving this world behind. You know, I heard over the news <clears throat> this woman who in recent floods had lost her house and the furniture in it, and she was distraught, and she said, um, you know, these conditions like floods and storms and rain, I grew up thinking that the Lord has brings those things, and, and therefore, uh, I don't feel bad about it. We'll just reconstruct. She said, but I'm not ready to leave and go there. I, I like it. I still like it here. Big difference in where we sit. And where she said, I do not mean to criticize her. Again, at least she acknowledged her Lord. I must admit to you, I don't like it in this human kingdom. I don't like it one iota. It is so dominantly controlled, it vibrates through and through everything that is against our Father's kingdom because that is what it has become. Now, in almost another breath, I could say it's almost normal in an age when a garden has served as a catalyst of negative and positive, and some can come out of it and even be fruit for the kingdom of heaven. It's almost a possible commonness at the end of an age for a garden to become this hideous. Now, I do not mean to criticize this garden. But even those of you that still love certain aspects of this garden know how out of control it has become in our care of its environment, in our misuse of the things that have been given to us. Uh, well, we'll talk about what overcoming is and what the, some of the specifics are as we go on with our questions. But I don't like this place. I like our Father's kingdom. Now. I was sent here to do a task. I liked it before my soul really took over this vehicle and awakened. I liked it a lot. I had a lot of fun. I was very into this world. But now that the soul has taken over it, 
and my father is speaking through it, I can honestly tell you that it's a miserable existence to be here. I try to make the best of it. I try to make it as pleasant as possible while I'm here, as pleasant for the students as it can be made while we're here. We have to do all kinds of little things to try to make it pleasant. But it's only because our minds are concentrated on things that are not of this world. When you are concentrating on things that are of another world that you are not in, you're left pretty vacant, except in the lessons and the knowledge of the fact that you're here for the purpose of overcoming. Who's next in our questions? Nora, what's next on our list? Well, we talked about <coughs> ages, and wonder if this would be an appropriate time to discuss the three ages, or are there more than three ages? Okay. Um, I think we mentioned in a session that some biblical scholars recognize that in the Bible there are references to the age that was, meaning the period of time prior to this earth age, and the age to come in reference to another earth age. <coughs> Excuse me. It's important that we discuss this a little bit. Uh, the scientists that so frequently uh, argue with uh, some religion and religionists or some religious people who consider themselves creationists, uh, some of these creationists uh, have the idea that this age is how old the planet is and that this is, at the end, it's all over. And I don't know if they think the planet's also going to be destroyed. And I'm not saying the planet isn't. I don't know what, uh, I'm not going to pre-guess uh, what our Father's kingdom plans to do with the planet. But for sake of understanding, I think it's important that we examine that this planet's been here a long time. And I'm afraid that the information that T and I have been given suggests that it has served as a garden a number of times. We don't have any information about there being any other garden that can serve as that stepping stone for what we call a human condition being elsewhere, even though it seems so unbelievable that in this vast, vast, vast heavens that there is not a garden. I'm not saying there isn't. I don't know. I simply don't know. But I do feel that the information that we have been given to understand certainly at this point does suggest that ages such as this period that we consider 6,000 years, that of a cycle for humans, where at the beginning was uh, the beginning was at after let's say here was a previous age and it went through something equivalent to 6,000 years or something similar to that and it those folks too had messed it up and it was time to recycle it because the environment was a mess and the clutter was a mess and I don't know what they'd done with space junk or if they'd gotten into space but it was time to go in and spade up the garden and harvest the yield and get rid of the spoils, take the weeds and let them be destroyed. Or maybe even some come in and take strong weeds, weeds from our father's point of view at the end of an age. The age of what we're calling approximately 6,000 years is pretty much illustrated as the beginning of that age of Adam's time, or right prior to that there were some other um, races that supposedly were put on the planet right prior to that time. But roughly it's still within the framework of that 6,000 year period or age. And that means that between now and the end of this decade, and I'm afraid I feel like we're off a number of years that it's going to be significantly before the end of this decade. It will be the end of this age. So spade time. And the big, big, big surprise will come. Now, what do we mean a big surprise? Well, 
when all that's out there comes into harvest, the big question will be how much of that will we witness? How much of that will take place without those who are running around on the planet seeing or knowing that will, that they will take place? For example, the possibility comes that some could come and take souls by the droves and all we would know is vehicles were dying by the droves because souls weren't occupying them any longer. We could call it a plague or a disease or we don't know. And I'm certainly not suggesting because of the age thing that that's what's happening. To age victims, far from it. But that's one way that harvesting could take place that we would not be able to observe. But it's altogether possible that our Father's Kingdom, as well as those in Lucy's Corporation, can come in at the end of the age in mass and do their taking of those who, now they, would, they might likely come in at different times. Um, now, here's a real delicate subject I hate to discuss. But I'm afraid that our Father's Kingdom is not going to come in. Oh, I can hear Lucy shouting at me before I ever get these words out of my mouth. I'm sorry, Lucy, I said. I hear Satan shouting at me. I'm afraid our Father's Kingdom is not going to come in and have someone looking like the common picture of Jesus floating down to the planet in flowing garb showing scars and saying, I, Jesus, have come to give you peace and peace for the world. I'm afraid our Father's kingdom desires no peace for the human kingdom. In our Father's kingdom can be found peace. Like we've discussed before, if you caught it, the human kingdom was not even designed to work, even though the human kingdom could have become the kingdom of our Father. Had those who were created in the human kingdom made all the options to do only His will instead of listening to those who were influencing them to do otherwise. So, here at the end of the age, back to question, ages, there were probably ages before this one and before the one before us. So I don't have any idea how many ages this garden has served as a graduation place or as an experiential garden for the same kind of harvest that we just discussed. I have no idea how many times after this that this garden will be used in that way. There's a strong possibility that the garden may at this time cease to be used as a further garden for the human kingdom and might actually become, in a sense, a base for our Father's kingdom for a period of time. I don't know how long the healing process would take place even if this garden was to be recycled and used as a human level garden again. If it is, if it is in fact used as a human garden again, another hypothesis that we must consider a little bit is that whatever that new garden is and when that new age does arrive after the recycling has sufficiently occurred to give it a fresh start, then there'll be a new Adam. Adam meant beginning, man, the first plant there. That was, there'll be a new Adam, a new Eve. There'll be a new Satan of all things. Someone to represent that same negative, to pull your eyes away from our Father's kingdom. I'm not saying that that is the way it's going to be. I'm saying if another age is if our father intends to use this garden in another planting similar to this one in the growth pattern that we have seen in this little age. The reason I brought that up is because a moment ago when I said that the big surprise could come that spacecrafts could come in by the thousands, maybe come in shifts. One shift of spacecrafts could come in from one part of the heavens that brought with them that one who came down 
with scars and flowing hair and flowing robes saying, peace on earth. We're going to solve all the problems of this world. Don't get me wrong, it wouldn't be Jesus. It would not be Jesus. It would not be a representative from our Father's kingdom. Now, those who had bought into that, and that's what they believed with all of their heart, I'm afraid they're prime targets to believe Him and to move into that condition. And it might even be harder to get out of that misinformation corporation after having left the human garden than it was at the human garden. If an opportunity does come to them later after having moved into the corporation outside of the human condition, don't forget, even that corporation at its highest peak is still in the human condition. But the only way they can get into our Father's kingdom is come back into the human condition that was designed where overcoming must take place, where change for misinformation and swapping it for truth. If our Father seems, as He sees you, reads you on His meter and He says, there's enough goodness in there, I want to give them a gift and let them migrate toward a source of that truth, then that overcoming would have to happen here. But as far as three ages are concerned, I, I don't know why, but I feel like there were many before this one, not just one. And as to what follows, I have no idea. It's strong likelihood it could be a garden again with a new Adam, a new Satan. But our Father hasn't told me. I don't know what the next plan is. I know what some of the possibilities might be. Next question. Who's that? Alex. Uh, I was wondering if you want <coughs> to uh, talk a little bit about uh, when people die, do they go to where they think they're going? And I've also been having the thought that's kind of, I don't know if it's tied into it, to part of your thought. Does that have anything to do with, and you may have just touched on this, what you're bound to on earth, you're bound to in heaven? Okay. Do people go where they think they're going? I'm afraid we just did touch on that, but we'll enlarge on that a little bit, and what you're bound to on earth, who you're bound to in heaven. Absolutely true. I mean, and it didn't come from dough. It didn't, <laughs> it didn't originate with us. Jesus said it, but I'm afraid it didn't originate with Jesus. It came from our Father's mind that what you're bound to on earth, you're bound to in heaven. Now that's just like a way of saying that what we just said, that if you expect to get into our Father's kingdom, you've got to break the shackles. You've got to destroy the binds. You've got to rise above the binds. By your effort, you've got to not be, not give in to the things that would hold you in the human condition or in the earth's grasp or the vibrations of the human kingdom. Now, if I, if I lose my vehicle or if anybody loses their vehicle in the world, whatever they were hooked on, career, family, dope, anything else that they're hooked on at the time they leave the vehicle, that's what they're going to be hooked on. Now, you're saying, well, they're going to heaven? Well, they might have just been put on ice. They might even be in a discarnate condition for an extended period of time. I'm not saying that our Father's kingdom puts everything on ice. Our Father's kingdom permits certainly many, many discarnate humans to remain in the discarnate state and serve Lucy's camp. I'm sorry, Lucifer's camp. in a discarnate condition. But they have to take a vehicle, they have to get into that vehicle, they have to gain complete control of that vehicle, and they have to acknowledge our Heavenly Father. They have to recognize that everything they have believed in has been wrong. They have to want cleansing, purity. They have to want to rid themselves of their whole way of life, their whole lifestyle, even as we've discussed their even identity if they possibly could, which they can't quite do, in order to be received into 
his household. But if they're in the process of doing that to the best of their ability, only he can judge the best of their ability. Then he will protect them and save them, even if he had to plant them in another age, if there's another age. I don't know. We're trying not to take chances. We spoke to you about, look, if the opportunity is here before you to leave this condition, to overcome this world, why take a chance on being satisfied for just being saved for a later date? Why not yield? Yield? What does that mean? That means turning yourself over to your Heavenly Father saying, I'm putty in your hands. Now, Lucifer's camp comes rushing in and says, See, brainwashed condition. And yet, if you love our Father, you'd say, Oh, I hope so. I hope brainwashed condition. Our Father jumps in and says, No, unfortunately, can't do that. I'll give you my mind as long as you continue to seek it. I'll give you more of it and more of it and more of it as you desire it. And I must admit that the more you have of it, the more we will be alike and the more commonness that you will experience in the other members of the household of our Father. I hate to tell you, Lucifer's camp over here that thinks they're such individuals with so liberated and then they're not they're not brainwashed they're going their own way they're entrepreneurs and everything they do you start writing a little chart of what they're into and then let's discuss who's brainwashed who's under somebody's spell who's almost a robot without knowing it thinking that they're individual they're individual in that they may go to different beauty parlors and different manicurists and different wedding chapels, and but they do the same things. They find themselves, maybe it's Italian instead of Chinese at the restaurant, or it's Methodist instead of Presbyterian, or they think they're so individual to have those little differences when there are no differences at all. Nora, your turn. If I'm seeking the truth and I really want to know the truth, will I find God? <laughs> of course the answer is from where we sit, if you're seeking the truth, we have to say our Father is the truth. We have to say we have found the truth. For we have found our Father. We know the difference now. We have advanced to the condition of knowing the difference. But the danger is there are many in seeking the truth who would arrive at a condition of finding God, but it might be the wrong God. A common thing in seeking the truth when you're on the wrong track is to end up with somewhat of a, an intellectualized agnostic condition of saying, well, I just can't know the truth, therefore I'll be as good a humanitarian as I can be and, and uh, I'll serve my fellow man and I'll work for charitable organizations and I'll uh, be an educator and I'll learn everything I can learn. But you know what? And their behavior and their indulgences continue to be the same behavior and indulgences of all those others out there who have not started any program of overcoming. Now, we can't really blame them for having not started a program of overcoming because, unfortunately, there's that ingredient that exists that our Father's Kingdom says, I have to send you a rep. I have to send somebody representing the kingdom of heaven that will take you through that overcoming. And that's their responsibility to take you through it. And we'll talk about that more. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. State your question one more time. I wanted to know if, um, well, if I'm 
I'm looking for the truth, and I really want to know it, will the end result be finding God? Well, <clears throat> certainly from our point of view, yes. From most of the departments in Lucifer's corporation, you'll find cosmic consciousness <laughs> or universal mind liberated spirit um, um, unrealistic uh, fantasies of going to other worlds and out of body experiences and I don't want to start condemning religions but uh, you know, there's something we have to return to here, and that is that our Father's truth is not a religion. It's simply the facts. Simply the way it is. It's the, the facts. Once we even begin to label it religion, we are already at that point a significant degree away from the facts and the truth. So then the question comes up, well, if that's the case, then what church is it that's going to get in? Well, what does the word church mean? Church is a body of believers. There's no uh, special denomination or religion that has a uh, foothold that's going to get the door open to them where the others aren't. Even though I must admit that our Father's Kingdom did in its teaching process in this particular age relate more directly with the Jewish experience as recorded in the Old Testament of our Bible and in the relationship of Jesus with his disciples and the other records that are shown in the New Testament of the Bible. That is still the most accurate account of our Father's Kingdom's relationship to human in this earth age. But you out there, I'm sure the question could come to your mind is, well, then what am I to do in my, uh, about my present church? My, you know, my folks are Catholic or they're Methodists or they're this or that. Does that mean I just throw that away? Do you throw away any good stepping stone? You, you consider thanksgiving for that stepping stone. You don't condemn anyone who is on that stepping stone. You praise them, if, particularly if they just moved into that stepping stone, from one that was less like our Father's kingdom in behavior and in concept, and think, well, at least they're trying to get closer. But and we have to, as we think of prophecy and the end times, we have to think of the true church. The true church is a body of believers that know the truth. Just a group of individuals that know the truth. And not know, now that's kind of a funny term, because they know a little bit of the truth, and they come more into the truth, and they come more into the truth, and they come more into the truth, as they fight off the untruth, fight off the untruth, and shed it. You know, in our classroom situation and the overcoming that these students have been through, they've been through hell. If there ever was a hell, they've been through it. If there ever was a purgatory, they've been through it. And I, I'm sure they can't count the number of times that they doubted everything and they wondered, what on earth am I doing? And then there were times when they would come and say, I did this and it was, a, I'm sure it was very offensive to the kingdom of heaven and to you and T and anybody representing the kingdom of heaven and you've got to help me get control of it. You've got to help me get past it. And that is the process of growth. That is the process of overcoming recognizing that you're, you've slipped, recognizing that your behavior has been a little less than it should have been and you 
see it now as worse than a little less, then you find it intolerable. And so you have to do, what's the pattern? Ask. You have to come back, put it in front of your teachers and say, I hate to admit this, but I did this. And I don't want to do it anymore. Will you help me? I know I can get past it. And then the teacher says to the older member, you heard what they just said. Can we help them? Do you want to help them? And so the information comes. It may not come right on the spot. It may cause them to wonder for a period of time, why am I not getting help? They may even in the meantime fall again. And by falling again, then they hurt even more because they want to overcome. And they're moving closer as they're in that process. I know that we have not gotten into the specifics of what separating from the world is, what overcoming the world is. We've talked about it a lot, but we haven't gotten into the, any significant amount of the specifics. And we're right next to the end of today's session, and we will get into those specifics in our next session, because it's time. I want to end this session with <clears throat> asking that you as an observer of these tapes. I want to suggest, if you want to, that you go and find a private spot and reach as high as you can reach and say, what direction should I take? I don't want to be misled. I don't want to be led away from you. I want to find my God. It's safer looking for your Heavenly Father than it is to look for truth, even though they're the same thing. We'll see you in the next session.